Hey, what is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce you to my wonderful co-host, Leah Matthews. How you doing, Leah? Hi, Chief. Doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm awesome. I'm super excited. You know, we don't we don't have um, Leah. We don't we don't have Julie today. She's uh, on a plane, but she surely uh, hates that she missed out on this opportunity to to, to be on this show because this this is a very special show. Uh, we got for a, sure. Yeah, yeah. And we, we got, will miss her. Yeah, we and, and safe travels, uh, Julie, out there. Uh, where, I, I don't know where she's going, but she, uh, safe travels on that plane. Uh, we got a super special guest today uh, that was a, a staple uh, on the basic cable that I had in my household growing up. Uh, my mother, you know, she always had uh, she always had the prices right. She always had Young and the Restless, and then our next guest. She always had them on, on the television. So, uh, and it shows how life, you know, comes full circle because now I have them on, on my show, which is which is crazy to think about. But uh, without further ado, Leah, please introduce today's guest. Chief, yes, we are super thrilled to have today's guest. He knows the military community well because he's been part of it, having listed in the Marine Corps and then attending the U.S. Naval Academy. He served in intelligence during his Navy career. He's best known, though, for his long-running daytime Emmy-winning Emmy talk show. And he's probably about to give us a little run for our money on our own show, Chief. So yep. I hope you're yep. ready. But... Please join me in welcoming Montel Williams. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Montel, thank you so much for taking time out to join us. We are super excited. We know our fans will love having you on. And for all the fans watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Share your love for Montel. Or if you have any questions for him, you can leave those in the comments section. We'll be reading them live throughout the broadcast. This is a good time to start your watch party so you can enjoy this with your friends. We know you want to. And if you're not following us, you should. So you'll know who's coming up next on Chief Chat. We have them every single week. Great. Awesome. Awesome. So Montel, so from one devil dog to a, or former devil dog to another, uh, Simplify. Uh, Simplify. I, yeah, I started my, I started my career off in the Marine Corps uh, and, I, and I transferred to the Air Force after that. But uh, it's always, it seems like we got a lot of guests that, that have Marine Corps ties. So it's, it's awesome to have you on the show today. No, thanks for having me. Where'd you go to boot camp? I went to, uh, well, I'm a Hollywood Marine. So I, I was in oh, San Diego. Oh, yes, my <laughs> <laughs> boy from Paris Island, but that's all right. We won't hold it against you. Uh, awesome, awesome. So uh, can you tell us where you joined us from uh, and how you've been faring during the pandemic? I'm in Miami, the former, you know, uh, epicenter of this pandemic. And, uh, now still an odd place because, you know, uh, as you know, all over the nation, every governor is handling this differently. And I'm not necessarily sure that I agree with the way this governor is handling this here because we have now tried to go to a stage three opening and we're watching, you know, from the second that it was announced, the numbers are going up the way they're going to continue to go up until we literally get some sort of a formal plan in place at the federal level that will help mitigate the spread of this Virus. We know what we have to do. It's really simple. And if we just stop being so selfish and, you know, uh, so narcissistic as individuals and recognize that we can save a nation, we can save a world if we just stepped outside of ourselves and did what the good Lord asked us to do. And that is to, you know, live not for self alone, but live for your fellow man. People would put a mask on their face. People would social distance. People would stop going out. People would stop acting stupid. And we could stop, shut this thing down. But as long as we continue to act as ignorantly as we have and as selfishly as we have, we're going to see this continue on. And this may be the downfall of a nation that has seen maybe its last of its greatest days. Yes. I know that maybe that may be a little bit too much for some people to handle. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm telling the truth. I just came in. I was walking my puppy, you know, like uh, my dog, well, about uh, five minutes before we got started. I'm walking across the street and this woman's walking at me and she's got her hand over her mouth uncovered with a mask and she's coughing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I literally, I, you know, I, I, you know, I hate to say what I felt like doing that was reach out and, you know, put a hand upside her head and say, how dare you invade my space? I don't care what you do for you, but don't you come in and try to infect me. But I made sure I did a, you know, wide berth, gave her a wide berth walked around her, walked inside a building, went upstairs and, you know, got angry. I went in and washed my face. She wasn't close enough. I was probably eight and a half feet away, but come on, man. 
do we really have to have people be this ignorant? It's not that hard to do. I'm tired of hearing all the excuses and all the, the whining about my face is warm, my face is hot, it makes it so hot. Like, Shut up. You know I mean, put a mask on and stop spreading this to the virus. Tell so, it, tell it. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us how you really feel, my tail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really feel, I'm sorry. No, I'm not well, sorry. I can't feel. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yep. Montel, so most people know you as a TV personality, and we kind of teased this a little bit before, but what they may not know is that you had a distinguished military career before that. So can you tell us about your military background and what led you to choose to serve? You know, I'm a, I am fortunately and blessedly, I'm, I am a Vietnam era vet. I came in right at the end of when we stopped giving up a national defense for Vietnam service. I came in and entered on a delayed entry program uh, from my high school. And I, I don't know how long ago that was, but you know, <laughs> I entered in 1973 and with delayed entry and I went to boot camp in 1974, uh, went to Paris Island. Um, I did really well. I uh, didn't graduate. Uh, I come out of Paris Island as the honor man, but I got meritoriously promoted. I was an additional meritorious promotion out of my uh, company out of Paris Island. So I picked up PFC when I came out. I was immediately, my, my MOS in the Marine Corps was supposed to be 2,800 communications specialist, communications electronics. So they sent me out to 29 Palms for training. But when I got there, I was immediately moved over to be a troop handler since I had been, you know, promoted early and, um, you know, I was wearing PFC and uh, went to work as a troop handler at 29 Palms and then immediately got uh, meritorious promoted to Lance Corporal. When that happened, I had, you know, a gunny who said, dude, you should be an officer. You shouldn't have been here to begin with. And I started looking at it uh, very seriously and applied to the Naval Academy Prep School program, got accepted. So I entered the Naval Academy Prep School uh, in the uh, middle of 75. Um, went there. That was a Newport Rhode Island back in the day. Um, I, you know, entered the Naval Academy Prep School with 40 other Marines and only 19 of us graduated. Only 12 of us got appointments to the academy and only four of us graduated from the academy. So we had a 90% attrition rate in that four year period of time. But um, I picked up E4 before I did a lateral transfer out of the Marine Corps into the Navy, you know, the day before I entered the Naval Academy, entered the Naval Academy, graduated with a degree in uh, general engineering, a minor in international security affairs. But unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to the military at the time, I probably suffered my first episode of MS uh, about 12 weeks before graduation. They couldn't figure it out. I was completely misdiagnosed. Um, spent, oh, you know, a couple of weeks in the hospital, both Bethesda, Walter Reed. I was seen at Johns Hopkins at the Wells Eye mm -hmm. Clinic. Nobody could figure out what was going on with me. And it was because back then, you're talking about in 1980, we were not diagnosing MS uh, the way we do these days. So back mm -hmm. then I was completely misdiagnosed. And because of what happened, I, and we know this as a fact, <clears throat> our graduating class, class of 1980 from Naval Academy was one of the last classes or groups in the military to receive immunizations with a gun because, you know, the first hundred of us that went through and got our immunizations received an overdose. And it wasn't the overdose that caused my MS. I probably had a predisposition to it anyway, but it triggered an immune response in my body that caused my first episode and left me almost half blind in my left eye. Long story short, I was put on a medical hold. I graduated from the Naval Academy. I'm one of the only people to do it this way. I graduated, walked across the stage, received my diploma, but I wasn't commissioned on that first day. I literally was commissioned in the rank of midshipman, and I served in what is a, a wartime rank. I actually served with that rank after graduation until I was later commissioned as a special duty intelligence officer, cryptologic specialty 1610. Uh, uh, because I had to pick a MPQ, uh, which for those listening in and don't know, MPQ is not physically qualified, but I was physically qualified. I just sort of lost the vision of my left eye and the Marine Corps would not take me back unless I had a correctable vision, which I did not have. And so I ended up having to transfer into the Navy. I figured, look, I, I spent four years here trying to get a degree and trying to get a commission. I'm going to get my commission. So I got a commission. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, as a special duty intelligence officer and ended up spending more time at sea than all of my contemporaries anyway, who had full physical qualifications. I mean, I spent about 300 days under the water. I spent, uh, oh, about 350 days on the water, deployed on every, you know, decent platform that the U.S. Navy has from cruisers to destroyers to, you know, uh, to aircraft carriers, to submarines, fast attacks. I was actually on 637 class submarines, multiple. I ended up um, being stationed at the National Security Agency and spent quite a bit of my time there before transferring to the NA2 position at Sublant, which was the cryptological direct support officer for cryptological missions on submarines. And um, did that and um, stayed on active duty fully until mid 88 where I started a program where I was speaking around the country during my leave time in schools about, you know, something that had, had really affected me. And that was back then, if you remember, 88 was when Nancy Reagan had just said no for the first time. And we were seeing some of the desperate things that were taking place in our society because of drug abuse, and especially in the African-American community. So I started speaking in schools to try to remind kids that it really isn't that hard to stay in school, study, learn, get an education, education is key. And I uh, started a program where I was doing that around the country and ended up coming off active duty, going to the reserves. I got a quick selection into uh, to 04 uh, in reserves and uh, went on and off active duty, TEMAC on and off over the course of 22 years. I ended up with a full 22 year career. Uh, it spanned 22 years. Um, in uh, the Navy and Marine Corps and you know, I finally, and when I was speaking around the country, I spoke to, excuse me, <clears throat> about a million and a half students in about 1,500 high schools all across America uh, with a uh, program that I had uh, developed out and trying to keep kids to stay away from negative trends. Yes. And then I really literally stopped uh, that program and walked right into the Montel Wim Show in 1991. And um, uh, literally, oh, that was uh, just kind of phenomenal because before I started the Montana Show, I um, was working, again, since I was in schools and working around the country, I was working very closely with the National School Board Association and worked to get the motion picture Glory, along with Pepsi and Columbia TriStar. That motion picture was literally a curriculum was made around it and it became part of the national high school curriculum. I did an open to that movie. As a matter of fact, I actually did an open that is in existence right now. You can, in most high school libraries across the country, still have a copy of it. And I'm on the copy of the movie Glory talking about the fact that, you know, it was a motivational, inspirational film that talked about, you know, the achievements of African-Americans in back in the civil war. And, uh, you know, that was then presented and, that literally ended up on the desk of the producer who shot the movie, whose name was one Freddie Fields, who's, you know, God bless his soul, he has passed away. But Freddie saw me on his movie, gave me a call and said, hey, pal, what are you doing on my movie? And that's literally what <laughs> launched the Bob Paul Williams show, because I flew out to Hollywood to see him on the 23rd of December, 1990. And by the 20th of January, 1991, I was in contact, contract negotiations with seven different syndicators, signed a contract on April 3rd or 4th and shot my first show on May 8th and went on the air around the country May 15th and uh, 1991 and stayed on the air for 17 years after. Man, that's, man, that's, that's awesome. And uh, man, you've done, you've done a lot uh, just in the, in the beginning stages of your career between the military and youth. You, you touched on uh, your, your diagnosis with MS, uh, and we'll, we'll ask you about your uh, the MS uh, l later in the show. Um, how how has what you learned in the military helped you in your t in your career um, in television? Well, I think you know, the military gives you a sense of discipline that you probably would not have gotten if had you otherwise not served. And you know, I think the you know I was a special duty intelligence officer, which made me a person who. Had to do a lot of research. You know, I was briefing Sublant, briefing, briefing Sinclair Fleet. I was briefing my boss on, you know, thousands of messages that were coming overnight. And so it, it, it put me in a mode to study and research. And that's what really helped me, I think, the most and helped me stay on the air with my show for as long as I did because I'm a voracious reader. And, and you know, I didn't do one topic on the Monta Worm show that I didn't personally approve. I didn't have one guest on the show. Um, after about the first three months that I didn't personally improve. 
And, you know, for me, it was paramount to study and, you know, uh, not that I needed to be the smartest guy on that stage. I needed to know more than anybody else was that was on that stage with me to make sure that they weren't going to hood with me while I was in the middle of the show. So yeah, yeah, uh, I think yeah. that was something that I was taught very well. You know, you brief, uh, you know, I'm a Kelso and you brief a couple of these guys back in the day that didn't uh, like you, you know, they wanted to make sure you didn't know just the topic on hand, but you had to know 10 topics from, you know, two weeks ago. And uh, so, you know, that's something that uh, stuck with me that stuck with me even now today. Awesome, man, that's awesome. So, uh, and, and when, you know, post military career and your celebrity status, you've always uh, created a platform to help out veterans. Uh, can you talk to us about those efforts and, and why it's so important to you? Well, I think even even during while I was doing my show, I probably I think I I spent uh, three separate trips in the Persian Gulf back before it was vogue for news outlets to go out there. I was out there making sure that we took messages from you know family members of soldiers to those deployed because uh, I recognized and understood what a nine month deployment in the Indian Ocean looks like. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, wanted to make sure the guys didn't feel as if they were forgotten. And uh, so I spent a lot of time doing that. And we covered a lot of military issues. I mean, every single Christmas, I would bring a soldier home somewhere around the world to surprise a family. Uh, spent a lot of time uh, speaking in various places around the country in front of military audiences to make sure that they weren't felt left out. And, you know, I, I don't know if you can remember, but if you take a look at, at any, you know, online photos from the Montana show, Back in, you know, the mid 90s on, I, you know, prominently displayed my flag uh, in the middle of my set it was one of the only shows to do so back then, um, uh, making sure that the guys understood that there's somebody like them that understands what they're going through. Our show actually aired on Armed Forces Radio and Television, like the show that I'm doing right now. I'm doing a brand new show. It's called Military Makeover. Where we take deserving veterans and we make over their homes from the ground up not to give them a hand out, but to give them a hand up. And the show airs, uh, show airs on uh, Lifetime every Friday morning. And uh, we do an episode, or we do six episodes pretty much for one family where the entire community comes out and they join together to swing hammers, paint brushes, put tile on roofs, dig out gardens, but help to make over a veteran's home to make them feel as appreciated as we need to make them feel, especially at a time like right now when we have such a, a society so divided that, uh, you know, we have certain people who don't understand that, uh, that uh, they are the only reason why we still have this vestige of democracy left in our world. Absolutely, man. And we, we definitely appreciate um, that, that you continue to serve for as long as you've been, you know, way probably before the military uh, and continue to serve us after the military. I know the service members really do appreciate that. Now, I'm working on some projects right now that are really paramount to our survival as veterans. You know, I've been working on a project for now 10 years that uh, a medical device that impacts traumatic brain injury symptoms. I've been working on a protocol that is uh, one of the only approved uh, protocols that is proven now to be a successful treatment for PTSD, not only combat PTSD, but for, you know, any form of PTSD. I've been working on that and trying my best to get that you know, uh, run up the flagpole so that we can get this out to veterans today. I mean, I think if we, the one program that we're working on, both programs we're working on, could have impact immediately on those 22 to 25 lives that are lost daily through suicide if we had this implemented. So I'm working as tirelessly as I can to uh, get those uh, put in place. And I've been, been, been met with, you know, um, you know, some some um, people who are enthusiastically supporting me at the senatorial level. I'm, I'm working with Senator Ernst and working with the VA, trying to get these uh, programs uh, incorporated and implemented. So, you know, I though I may have taken the uniform off my back, I see the uniform when I step in front of a mirror. Awesome. Hey. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. So along those lines, um, you've shared about your show Military Makeover and you've shared about projects and programs that you're working um, to help continue helping veterans, but what's ahead for you? Anything else new or exciting that you can share with our viewers that you're working on? Any other projects? I have uh, two uh, podcasts on. Uh, they run three times a week. Uh, I've got one podcast that's called... Uh, 
uh, let's be blunt with Montel, uh, which is a con- is a uh, sounds podcast- good. <laughs> it's a podcast that talks about you know the value of cannabis in this world, and you know though we just passed the hemp bill, where you know a lot of people have uh, have been jumped into the CBD space. We recognize very clearly that there have been several peer reviewed. Uh, published documents out by doctors all over the world who understand the viability of, you know, certain cannabinoids to help, you know, deal with some of the stresses that, you know, some folks have been left behind and also in pain management. And so I'm working very diligently at trying to, like I have now for almost 20 years, long before this became Vogue, I was involved in helping the various states, you know, write and move legislation forward to ensure that, Patients like me who have neurological illnesses or other illnesses that cannabis can help with have a good access to viable medications. So Let's Be Blunt is a podcast that gives out, I think, some of the best information in the world about the most up-to-date information about what's going on in the cannabis world. And then I have another podcast that's called Free Thinking, where we do just that. I've having politicians and people on from all over the world with different points of views just to discuss and have conversation to prove again that we do live in a nation where conversation is still valued, even though in some situations we just saw like the other night that, uh, you know, at the uh, head of our, at the presidential level, you know, a conversation isn't of value because, you know, we had a debate that was literally one of the most worthless hours and a half that I think we as a nation have ever seen. And uh, hopefully we will see the next one be much more valuable in showing that we can sit down and talk about our differences without acting like children on uh, uh, bad playgrounds. Yeah, no, there's, there's so much value in, in just having a conversation. I think a, a lot of the issues, even in the military, uh, when, when we have issues uh, and, and we send stuff through email and all this other stuff, that gets blurred and all kind of uh, misinterpreted and I'm like, just go over there and have a conversation. And you have a conversation, man. We can we can uh, build, you know, move mountains with conversation. Absolutely, you know, that's one of my terms. Is mountain get out of my way? But you know, the problem is that you know we've now become a society that you know uh, hides and cowers behind devices like this one. You know, I, I'm glad that we're now doing you know, things like Zoom calls where I can see your face, you can see mine, but you can't feel the essence of me. And I really can't feel your essence. I see your image. But, you know, if I was sitting in the same room with you, um, there'd be a whole different way that I think we would be communicating because even, you know, three feet away, I think, you know, bodies and molecules feel that, that presence of another human being. And, you know, I can't wait for us to get back to that in a time when we can get back to that because I think we've used the phone and we've used, you know, the, the laptop as an excuse to not uh, have human contact. And I think it's, we got to get back to that before we lose it forever. Absolutely. So we, we have um, soldiers, airmen, Marines, sailors, coasties, and even uh, space, space Force personnel. That's, that's a new one for you. Uh, uh, we got them watching today. So. Uh, do you have any words of inspiration or thanks uh, for any of the heroes that are watching today? Oh, come on, man. I think, you know, thank you is, is, is to, you know, just the words, thank you for your service have become, you know, just something that slips off people's lips without, again, really understanding what they're even saying. I'll, I'll be at the airport sometimes and I'll see, you know, a soldier go by and I hear somebody say, thank you for your service. And they don't even wait to see whether or not the soldier responds and says, no, thank you. Um, you know, so, I mean, yes, of course I say thank you to all of our brethren who are out there, out there on the front line, protecting and serving and doing what, what, you know, our constitution says, trying to defend our constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But I think that's just lift service. I'd rather do things for our veterans and try my best to, to do as much as I can, when I can, and in the way I can. Um, if there was one piece of advice that I would give every veteran uh, there today is that to, you know, stay true to who you are at your core. I mean, uh, you alone own the definition of who you are and you can use that definition to do so much good, not only in our military society, but in our society at large. I mean, right now, you know, what people don't understand is it's because of our military that we have had, you know, they look back over 
the last 20 years or 30 years and try to figure out why are race relations so bad now when they weren't so bad back then? Well, we went through some horrific times when, you know, we know that our military is made up by 50% people who are of color, whether they be African American, Asian American, Native American, you know, Jewish American, you know, Hispanic American. And, you know, in that foxhole, when there was a bullet coming your way, it didn't try to discern the color of the skin of the person it was going to hit, or that IED didn't say, oh, wait a minute, no, let me just blow up a white guy. No, the IED was blowing up everybody. And when that IED hit one of our fellow soldiers, not one soldier stopped and said, oh, it's a white guy, I leave him in the, in, the, in the ditch, or it's a black guy, I leave him in the ditch. They jumped forward and said, let me help. Why? Because, you know, from the day we're indoctrinated in boot camp, we are taught that we are graded on our support for equal opportunity. In the early 70s and the early 80s, you know, we were the only business or profession in America that you actually received a grade for your support of equal opportunity. Come on now. Now, whether or not you still hid your hood in your locker, it didn't matter. You at least stepped out in front of your other troops and said, recognize that somebody's going to hold me accountable if I don't support equal opportunity. And that transferred into our society when people got out of the military. You know, they continued to carry that thought on. And nowadays, you know, where we are seeing the dwindling numbers of our people who actually put a uniform on their back, we're down to below, what, 0.3%, 0.03% of the entire population actually supports and defends this constitution for the rest, the 99.37% of the country. That's the reason why I think we've seen some of the issues that we had. We, we look back at the early 70s and the 80s. The reason why we became one of the most educated societies in America is because veterans coming home from Vietnam came home with the GI Bill. They went to college. They gave their GI Bill to their, their children. And that's what spawned education in America. And right now, we don't have the same numbers doing that again as we did then. And so I think that, you know, the, the military can lead the way in race relations and in equity relations in this country if we just shut up and let them do so. Oh man, those awesome words. And I, I remember, you know, joining the Marine Corps, uh, they, they would tell us to call, you know, when we just trying to discern between uh, different Marines, it, it would be a, a dark green, a light green Marine. And, and they wanted us all to understand that we, we were green, we were brothers, or, or we sisters in arms, and uh, we, we got each other's uh, six. Um, I'm telling you, not one bullet aimed your way could discern what the color of your skin was before it ripped the hole. Correct. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. And then um, talking about your diagnosis, you've been very outspoken and candid about your battle with multiple sclerosis. So what compelled you to be so public about that diagnosis? Well, you know, I've learned along the way that as I learn things, it's important for me to share them. You know, how dare you live on this planet and and find out something that can help you and then not share it with somebody else. That is, again, it's the narcissistic mm -hmm. part of who some people are. That's mm -hmm. not who I am. You know, I, I learned very early on that, you know, there were people who were suffering in silence. People who were suffering alone. And there was no need for them to do that. And the fact that you come into the open and you come into the clear sight of others, that's where your help can come from. So I wanted to open up and make sure that I shared everything that I learned uh, to help me deal with my battle, share it with others so that they would be able to at least, you know, gain some benefit from what uh, the path that I was on. So I started very early on as I started learning things about diet and learning things about ex uh, exercise, I started learning things about Part of the reason why I even got involved in the technology is technology that has been designed or was created for uh, traumatic brain injury. I learned very early on that it worked for me with my MS. And so I've worked very hard to get that medical device into the mouths of every person, well, every veteran walking around suffering from any form of traumatic brain injury, but also any person walking around suffering from MS. We've now pushed this device to a point that in Canada, we have FDA approval in Canada for mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, balance and gait, and we have approval for, you know, uh, mild to moderate uh, MS, remitting relapsing MS, and uh, balance and gait. And we are treating patients in Canada right now with a device that is helping and showing significant improvement for some. And so 
I'm going to keep doing that, keep fighting a good fight and trying to make sure that I share again everything that I've learned with as many people as I can. And, you know, if you wanted to catch any one of my podcasts, you can catch it on YouTube or all the other major podcast platforms. I'm on iTunes, iHeartRadio. I'm on Instagram. My Instagram handle is uh, uh, Montel or at Montel underscore Williams. And my Facebook handle is Montel Williams, Montel MS fan. You can go up on facebook.com forward slash Montel Williams fan, and you can get me in cover and follow some of the things I'm talking about. So uh, Montel, wow. you, you've, tr you've truly inspired a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I want to kind of share a story because one of my good friends, uh, Gabby Harmeal, uh, she's a retired master sergeant from the Air Force. Uh, she was having medical issues that they could not figure out what was going on. Uh, shortly after her retirement, uh, she finally saw a doctor and she was diagnosed with MS as well. So she wanted me to send you this message that, um, you know, she, when she, she she was relieved that that finally somebody could tell her what, what she actually had because she was going, she had anxiety just trying to figure out, okay, something's going on and nobody can tell me what's going on. And um, so she said she read up on your story and your advice um, and it helped her stay grounded. And um, she's also, she's already tuned into your podcast and talked about some CBD uh, remedies for her, for, for her pain management and all the other stuff. And so she just really, really wanted me to give you a, a, a big shout out and thank you for, uh, for, for sharing information. Just like you said, uh, what's information without sharing? Mm -hmm. Knowledge without sharing is, is selfish and like you said, narcissistic. Uh, but, but that's a personal friend of mine that really I was inspired by your story. So thank you for that. Well, thanks. Well, you know, unfortunately, MS is one of those odd diseases that, you know, a lot of doctors are not as well trained as they could be in how, uh, in how to discern the symptoms and figure out uh, uh, and make that kind of a diagnosis. And unfortunately, a lot of women end up going through, and I say a lot of women, but because back in the early 80s, back when I should have been diagnosed, I wasn't diagnosed with MS because back then, most doctors thought that uh, this was a disease that only afflicted women of Northern European descent and how wrong were they then and how wrong they still can be now. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I often say this and I will say it now and for all anybody listening, you know, if you have something that's bothering you and something that's an issue and you go to one doctor, you don't get the answer. Doctors are not God. If they were God, none of us would be sick. Yeah. So stop thinking that they are gods. They don't know everything. If they thought they knew and those who think they know everything shouldn't even, I think, have a license. You know, the truth of the matter is, you know, doctors have something called continuing medical education for a reason. And that's so that you can continue to learn more and learn more and learn more. And so if you don't get the answer from one doctor, doctor shop, get a doctor, go, go to another doctor. But eventually someone will be able to take a look at your symptoms and maybe even diagnose you with MS or something else. But at least you'll get the answers that you need to have. Don't just rely on one. Mm -hmm. okay. There was a similar story, Chief, um, a comment in the there was a comment in the comment section, a very similar story who a young lady shared that her mother, um, you know, she just found great inspiration in she, also with MS. Um, and so just being able to connect, you know, feel that connection uh, by what you have shared with your um, illness. I know my books are still out there. I mean, I've written, you know, fortunately I've written eight books, you know, five of which have been New York Times bestsellers, uh, three of them really about my journey with MS, uh, living well at Montel, living well emotionally. And, um, uh, uh, geez, I can't remember what the other one was. Um, but uh, you can you can find them, Google them, and you can find those books out there. And uh, it'll give you, I think, you know, an answer to some of the questions that maybe some people have had. Yeah. And so, um, and you mentioned uh, fitness uh, and, yeah. nutri and nutrition. And so, uh, and man, you're still looking good after all these years. Like, and so what's your secret? So of course in the military, we got to stay in great shape. And during the pandemic, you know, folks, we, we couldn't get in mass PT sessions and we had to kind of do stuff on our own and find that self-motivation. But can you give us any uh, nutrition or, 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 or stuff that you, you use to stay in shape? Well, I mean, recently, and you know, I've, I've literally done a deep dive in a journey, not one size fits all, but exercise is the best thing that any one of us can do. I got to tell you, this pandemic has, you know, sent me for a loop a little bit. You know, the last six months, I have not probably exercised as much as I should be. You know, I'm getting in about four to five days a week. I, I really would rather be doing six or seven days a week, to be honest with you. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm at three to four days a week is what I'm hitting. And I, I want to get more than that in now. 
Um, I, uh, for a while, I, I did a journey in multiple diet regimens. I, for a while, tried to be a vegetarian. That worked for me for about a year. Eh, I learned some things about vegetables that I hadn't learned before. So I ensured that I made that a bigger part of my life. I turned and became a vegan for about a year and a half. And that worked for a while, but that wasn't something that I wanted to stay at because I didn't feel comfortable with that. And so I shifted over to now where I probably try to, I mean, I'm eating, you know, at least 60 to 70% plant-based food, plant-based diet every single day. And I have, have found um, some really good effects out of, uh, I'm sorry, my other book, I just remember Climbing Higher. I don't know why I forgot that. But Living Well so Living Well Emotion and Climbing Higher, those are three books that we can, you can follow my journey through my diets and my journey through MS with. But, you know, I uh, lately in the last full year have been, uh, maybe you've heard the term, an intermittent faster. I've been mm-hmm. found some real true value in intermittent fasting. And it's not as hard as most people think it is. And there's been recent peer reviewed studied uh, uh, documents published that talk about how intermittent fasting does help with gut health. And so, you know, anybody can look it up. The term is intermittent fasting. It means a lot of different things to a lot of people. The way I do it is I ensure that I try to eat my last meal of the day every day, no later than 6 to 6.30. And I don't put another piece of food in my mouth until in the morning and that's normally somewhere around 10 to 11 o'clock in the morning. I try to put 12 hours between my last meal and my first meal. And that allows your gut time to recover. And that's something that a lot of people don't do. A lot of people eat eight or nine at night and try to jump up in the morning at 730 in the morning, especially in the military. You know, you you eat at eight or nine at night, then you jump in the morning at 630 in the morning and put more food in your body. You've never given your body an opportunity to expel the waste that it has created. And you haven't given your body a time to process what's already there. And that's really important. So um, I think, you know, it helps to lessen some of your stress. And I've, I'm also, you know, I, I've really kind of in the last now, since COVID for sure, no ifs, ands, or buts, I have literally tried to reduce the amount of caloric intake that I'm taking in. We don't have to eat what we think we have to eat. You know, they built the food chart, food pyramid years ago that was really built, I think, on economic needs rather than on your actual physical need. I, you know, that, that whole idea of getting up and having to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day isn't something that's true. That's not true. When we were little you know, rodents on a savanna, we ate when we were hungry. Yeah. You ate when your body needed to have energy. And you know, you want, of course, getting up in the morning or, or having, a, having a first meal of the day. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to shovel food in your mouth within the first 15 minutes of you waking. You know, if you can push that off a little bit and take your time, drink a nice, you know, six, seven ounces of water, you know, put that in your body when you first wake up, get that water back in because at night while you're sleeping, you are dehydrating. So get that water back in your body in the morning when you wake up and then, you know, pick and choose what it is you're going to have. So far today, I've only had, you know, uh, I had a bowl of oatmeal with some pecans in it. That's all I've had. And I probably won't eat again until I make dinner fry and my wife at about six o'clock and you know to this today is going to be one of my meat days and so i'll eat a really nice piece of steak that i'll chop up and put over a really robust salad that i make for the two of us and i make salads that include you know spinach garden greens tomatoes cucumbers i'll uh, you know I, I put pine nuts i use three or four different types of nuts and I use very, very basic, you know, dressing. I'll use just um, avocado oil, olive oil, and maybe a little bit of balsamic vinaigrette. That's it. Just a pinch of salt, pinch of pepper. That's it. I mix that up. I'll make a steak that I'll, I'll grill for the two of us, or I'll, I think tonight I'll probably pan fry them both. And I take them out of fan and I pan fry them with olive oil. I chop them up into very small pieces and place that over the salad so that I'm eating that piece of steak. And that, and I know that that piece of steak is about four and a half to five ounces of steak. That's all I need. I don't need much more than that. And then I won't eat anything else until 10 to 12 o'clock tomorrow morning. Damn. So hopefully, you know, those mm-hmm. tips that you gave us can, can have us looking like you. <laughs> I hope I can get to look like you, uh, you know, 20 <laughs> years from now. Because, uh, man, that's, that's awesome. 
Rather, it's maintaining it, and it does, you know, making sure you drink. That's one of the things that I, I really would wish for all those who are, you know, sequestering away at home and mm-hmm. you know, trying to social distance, drink as much water mm-hmm. as you can. I'm saying that to you as much as I'm saying it to me. I need mm-hmm. to start drinking more water. I need to be drinking water every single day. I'm beating myself over the head about it. My wife beats me over the head about it. She gets up. <laughs> Water, water, drink your water and we really need to hydrate 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 yes hydration is key especially in losing weight you're you can't lose weight if you're not hydrated so you can't lose weight if you know you you stick with this paradigm that you have to have a breakfast lunch and dinner i, I say you're just fooling yourself you don't you don't you're not as hungry as you think you are mm-hmm. so, you know, I think if a lot of people would just stop and take the time to say, yeah, do I really need to shovel that, that sandwich in my mouth right now? No, you don't, <laughs> you know, eat an orange, you know, eat a couple of grapes, you know, eat a, you know, a cup of watermelon, good to go, done. Now move on, get that dinner when you need it, eat that, that solid meal when you really, when you really need the extra energy. Excellent. So just want to pause for a second to look at the live feed and share with you. People are watching um, from all over. They're wishing you well. Laura said, Montel, I was just wondering how you were doing the other day. Um, People saying, thank you for your service. So just wanted to be sure and share those thoughts with you. Thank you so much. I really always appreciate the well wishes that I get from all over the world. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that, that even now, you know, uh, you know, at this stage of my life, you know, we all want to be appreciated for what we do. And, you know, uh, any acknowledgement has been great. And I, I, I wear it and, and feel it in my soul. So I thank you for the well wishes that you just extended. Yeah. And so you, you man, you so you, you get a lot of you're getting a lot of love from the from the military, uh, obviously, uh, and we definitely appreciate everything that you've done for us and you continue to do for us, um, you know, because, you know, we, like you say, we are going to take off the uniform uh, one day, but we, when we look in that mirror, we still see the uniform and we still compel to help. And the military has taught me personally that uh, it just, life is, is, like you said at the beginning, it's bigger than me. Like the pandemic, it's, it's bigger than just me. Uh, look out for your fellow man, your fellow American, your fellow Marine, uh, airman, soldier, all this other stuff. So uh, I, I had a pretty good foundation uh, growing up. Uh, my, my grandmother loved everybody uh, and she kind of taught me that. But then once I got into the military, I was young and I kind of was a little, more, a little selfish, I guess, at, at, in my early 19, 20. But as I got older and, and they put me in charge of a, of a team of people and I knew that these people were depending on me, man, it, it just changed my perspective so much. Well, you know, I mean, everybody's a little selfish when they're younger. That, that's why it seems so ridiculous to see the selfishness that we're seeing in uh, those people who supposedly represent us, uh, the politicians that are out there. You know, these guys are old enough to know better. You know, a life isn't lived, you know, for what you do for yourself. A life should be lived for what you do for mankind. You know, you stop for a second and think about this. I mean, over the course of you know, the last 2000 years of, of, of uh, evolution in man, you know, if you really sat down and ask any person, ask any person, name 40 people that are inspirational historical figures, they'll stop at about number six or seven because they can't name them. And there have been billions of people on this planet. But then when you stop and you think about the people that they name, those are all the people that lived a life not for themselves alone they lived a life for others mm-hmm. and you know i mean if we make that one of the basic tenets of our soul you know uh you know i i i i, I here's a, something for all of your your viewers you know i for the last easily 20 years of my life before i i actually nod off to go to sleep the last thought in my mind I ask myself a question every single night before I go to bed. What did I do today that's worth talking about tomorrow? Yep. What did you do today that's worth talking about tomorrow? If you did things just for yourself, it's really not worth the conversation with a lot of other people. If you did something that impacted another person's life or soul, how impactful is that for mankind? I and mean, at the end of the day, when we leave here, you know, I mean, you know, give it, you know, a, a month or two months after you're gone 
you know, very seldom is your name ever brought up again. Yeah. If you've lived for self alone. Yep. Well, I can tell you that people are going to be talking about you for your legacy is solidified in my opinion. Uh, and you've inspired so many people along the way. So just, um, thank you again. Uh, thanks for sharing your fascinating story with us. Uh, just know the service members, man, and we really, really do appreciate you. Uh, and we wish you all the best in all your endeavors. And we're, we're definitely going to continue to support you. Thanks so much. And you know, my show, uh, uh, um, Military Makeover has got picked up by Armed Forces Radio and Television. So that can be seen all over the world right now. And um, if you know a bit of a veteran that, uh, you know, is deserving of having a makeover at home, make sure you you know, uh, uh, shoot us a note and recommend it. There's a spot on the show at the end of every single show where we talk about that, where you can, you know, go up online and nominate a deserving veteran. I have a show that's called Military Makeover Operation Career, where we feature those businesses that hire veterans and those veterans that have gotten jobs with businesses across the country. And so I'm trying my best to make sure that our veterans know we haven't forgotten you. And thanks for what you do. And right now, thank you for what you are doing, setting an example for a nation that is in so dire need of one. Absolutely. So, um, yep. So we're going to end it here, um, the interview. We appreciate you. If you could stay back for a second, uh, I, I want to uh, get some information from you so I can uh, show you my appreciation for, for doing Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much. And thanks to all those who've tuned in. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. So